So I think uh, the importance of SMBGs can never be done away with. And although we are living in an era of continuous glucose monitoring, we have to realize that SMBG still stays the main part of our, you know, monitoring, glucose monitoring that we tend to do. Although, you know, we do tend to get different aspects of information related to glucose monitoring from SMBG and CGM, and both the two of them are complementary to each other, and they're not different or they cannot be replaceable by each other. Uh, let us just walk back and see what the countrywide data is from the ICMR. And we know that population studies related to diabetes in different parts of our country uh, ranges almost from 4.3% to 13.3% if you walk across the different states in India. And uh, it's higher in the urban areas, about 11.2% than in the rural areas and higher in the mainland states as compared to the north northeast population. Let me just point out one caveat that although we may have similar A1C values, let's say a patient has you know, A1C of 7.5, but how you get that 7.5 is very important. You may have a very stable control or you may have a very fluctuating control or a lot of intraday variability. And despite the fact that there may be a lot of intraday variability, you may still have the same A1C or at times even the intraday variability may be high and yet you may have the same A1Cs. So the A1C just reflects the overall picture of the patient but it does not give you the day-to-day -day glycemic status of the patient and that's where it becomes very important for us to look at the SMBG values. Because when you do the SMBG, you're looking at the patient's pre-meal, post-meal values, you know, 3M values, which really gives you uh, what's happening to the patient at night time. Is there any nocturnal hypoglycemia? And this information about intraday variability cannot be extrapolated from the HbA1c. So as I said that the two in the investigations really complement each other and do not replace each other. Now there are limitations of A1c and we know that there are situations where the A1c may be falsely low and these are where there are red cell survival time is less acute blood loss, hemolytic anemias, certain immunodeficiency, virus positive states. So these are all various situations where the uh, A1C may be falsely low. But equally important is the A1C may be falsely elevated and the most important is in our country the iron deficiency anemia. We know that a large part of a population tends to be iron deficient and you've got to be extremely careful when you interpret A1C under the situation. The other reasons could be of course hypertriglyceridemia, hyperbilirubinemia, uremic states and important in uremic states there's a carbamylation that tends to happen and that's why you may get a falsely elevated A1C. And we don't don't have a better alternative to A1C as of now for monitoring purposes because of lack of standardizations. And that's why we still tend to fall back on A1C for uh, monitoring purposes. And there could be situations where the A1C may be, you know, increased or decreased and these could be hemoglobinopathies or where the, there's an increased erythrocyte turnover and in situations where you need to give blood transfusions. Uh, as I just mentioned, that the SMBG tends to complement, and what we mean to, let me just put in simplistic terms, when you're looking at the SMBG value, you're looking at that point what the blood glucose is representing. So it gives you a real-time measure of the blood glucose at that point, and it often helps us to see how a particular meal is sort of, you know, altering the blood glucose status of a patient. And that will help you to sort of organize your meal patterns. Also, it helps us to tell us that if there are different path, times of the day, if you're doing multiple monitorings in the day, then which is the point of the day that you have a hyperglycemia or a hypoglycemia? And you can probably alter your medications accordingly to decide that, you know, what should be the change that you need to do. And this is more valid when you're using insulin for the patient. It helps us to really organize the insulin dosing and the type of insulin that you use for the patient. And it gives you an opportunity to fine-tune the therapy that helps you to keep the blood glucose in a very narrow bandwidth rather than with very wide fluctuations. So what is structured SMBG? It's basically the monitoring of glucose with the right frequency, right time, 
and with the right situation. And that's what is important to get the most productive output of monitoring and SMBGs. So it's really not just a fantasy that you tell a patient, do twice a day or three times a day. And very often patients come to us with charts, which either the patient has done only a fasting glucose or has done a random glucose in a day. And you have all kinds of charts that come to you. And that's really uninterpretable because you don't know what you need to do out of that chart at all to make some decision making. So you have to tell the patient how a glucose monitoring needs to be done, right? So the structured bl blood glucose testing is you predefine the time points and the situations in a proper frequency. And often the way that you do this will generate a very reliable and medically relevant blood glucose information, which is support your therapeutic decisions. And as I said, that the SMBG and the CGMA complement, and I'll show you situations where this complement helps you to make decision making when you want to alter the treatments of the patient. Now, often when you look at the different SMBG patterns in the day, it gives you a pattern analysis and it tells you how much of you know, glucose variation that you have in a day based when you monitor it in different timelines of uh, the time points of the day. So structured blood glucose testing and pattern analysis are tightly connected parts of therapeutic decision making process. Uh, what is pattern management? So if you look at basically the pre-meal and the post-meal glucose targets, and then you gather this data and extrapolate that along with the kind of meal the patient has taken, and as well as if the patient is on insulin, then the type of dose that the patient has done. Uh, combine it with, of course, looking at the activity levels of the patient, the schedule, the emotional stresses. And when you look at all these patterns that emerge when you look at, you know, putting on one side the meal patterns, the exercise patterns, the way the dosing of the drugs have been done, and you look at the output and you look at the pattern analysis of the SMBG, you are able to make a correlation out of it and say that, is the patient well in target? or what needs to be altered in the pattern so that you can get the appropriate a A1Cs. So as Manoj in his earlier talk had pointed out, there could be situations where you have high A1C and the point of care testing may be bang normal. And there could be situations where your A1C may be normal and your point of care testings may be very high and you don't know what is going wrong. And unless you do a CGM, you will not be able to make out that is the patient well in control or badly controlled? And the only way to do that is either you do a CGM or you do multiple point analysis of SMBG and you do it in a structured manner to get a more constructive output where you can see the fluctuations happening for the patient. Then you obviously look at what are the influencing factors and then you take the appropriate action. And then of course you reevaluate and see that whatever action you have taken, has it made an impact to see that, you know, whatever the action is, has it translated into better control in any kind of a way. So we know that when we treat patients with diabetes, you start, of course, with diet, exercise, oral agents, and obviously, at some point of time, you need to think of intensification of therapies, and this may be with injectable therapies or escalation of the oral therapies. Either you do a dual therapy, triple therapy, and at some point of time, of course, you move the patient onto insulin, and there could be various ways that insulin deliveries can happen, and you, of course, have to look at the patient and decide the pattern of insulin delivery that you need to give of the patient. Now, where is the situation in India? Uh, if you look at the SMBG International Working Group, and this, they conducted a survey to study the SMBG testing in 13 countries, including India. The lowest testing rate for SMBG was found in India, 0.2%. In a study in Delhi, in the middle and high income groups, only 28% had a home blood glucose monitoring device, leave alone testing. And a survey conducted in Chennai found that only 24% of the survey participants had a knowledge process of SMBG. I'll tell you our own you know, experience. Last year we did the uh, Defeat Diabetes campaign. And when we looked at how many patients actually tested blood glucose, there's hardly less than about 20% that we found across the country tested the blood glucose levels. And that was a really eye-opener for us because when we look at these kind of, obviously our patients either are undetected, uncontrolled, or 
heading for problems in some sort of a way or not. So first and foremost is the awareness of testing blood glucose has to be made very high. Leave alone doing anything else. And once you bring the awareness of testing, then comes the question of you know deciding the therapy and how you need to alter your therapy decisions. And this helped us to, you know, the Defeat Diabetes campaign was a big campaign for us because we brought awareness in 100 days to 128 million people. And we sort of, as a part of the campaign, tested 1 million people in one day, which brought us into the Asia Book of Records. The exercise was not to get into the Book of Records, but the exercise was how can we make awareness about blood glucose testing much better in the wider population so that you know people do recognize the need for testing the blood glucose. Very often patients are undiagnosed and they may be harboring diabetes. It's only on a casual examination for some reason that they find that they have diabetes and then you know the necessary action starts. And from various studies we've seen the importance of early testing, diagnosis and starting therapeutic so that you can prevent future complications from happening. So the unmet need in the country-specific SMBG guidelines is that uh, some of the reasons why people don't do this testing process, let's look at the flip side of things, is because of availability of healthcare resources, maybe because of spending capacity, because if you look at a multiple testing in a day, and if you, and if you average out to think that you know each test strip costs about 20 rupees, maybe plus or minus different you know, companies. And if you say, I want to test five times a day, that's almost about 100 rupees a day that somebody has to spend on only glucose testing. So you have to optimize your resources and then decide what should be the frequency and how often you need to do the testing so that you can get meaningful information about the SMG BG to take the necessary action. So it shouldn't be just an exercise where patient does the blood glucose testing, comes to you with charts, and you take no action on it. It's a colossal waste of money that you're really doing. So those charts should give you some interpretation to change something for that patient which will make him in a better target goal as such. And obviously education makes a very important you know, part of this entire treatment. And you have to answer the patient the need for testing. And if you don't educate your patient back, you'll be sure that this patient is going to come back to you with blank charts or very badly managed chart, which is really going to be of no value to you in any kinds of way. Uh, we were part of this RSSDA consensus guideline on SMBG, uh, which we brought out about two years back. We are now, of course, coming out this year with a new guideline from the RSSDI. With, this was only on SMBG, now we're broadening the scope of the guideline to encompass the entire glucose monitoring because we have now moved beyond SMBG to a lot of other ways. So the new guideline probably by the end of the year should be available from the, uh, we were part of, I think Manoj is here and all of us have been part of this writing of the SMBG guidelines for RSSDI. Uh, what we did recommend was the way we need to test blood glucose in the guideline, how often that you need to do in different clinical situations. So patients on type 2 with oral agents, on insulin plus oral agents, type 1s, basal insulins, premix, elderly patients, pregnancy. So we sort of charted out the frequency of blood glucose testing in these sort of situations so that we can educate our patients and probably make more meaningful decisions if you do in a proper structured manner the SMBG testings. Uh, you have to remember that despite all the advances in diabetes therapy that we have, we have a huge number of you know, oral agents that we have got, the entire spectrum of insulins that we have got, and a lot of delivery systems that we have got now. So it's very hard that if you optimize the resources in the right manner that you can't control a patient to the target goal and the way you would like it to be as per recommended, you know, recommendations of different societies. But yet, more than 75% of our patients with diabetes in India have poor glycemic goals. Our national average of HbA1c is 9%. That's the true fact, and dif different studies have proved this. And we need to really sit back and analyze and see why are we not getting to the goal, and why only about less than 20% of our patients are at goals of less than, optimum goals of less than 7%. So our national average being 9%, sometime back we said, can we reduce the national average by just 1%? And from the UKPDA study, we know the benefits of just 1% reduction, how it translates into benefits. So we said, let alone 
Leave the fact that we want to get to less than 7%. Let's just bring from 9 to 8% and maybe we'll be able to get better targets in terms of reduction of complications related to diabetes. Uh, one of the drivers of poor control was, of course, clinical inertia, and we keep talking about it all the time as a main reason for suboptimal glycemic control. And what we do realize is there is an inertia on part of the doctors, the patients, and very often the doctors do not intensify therapies, initiate first and intensify at the same time. So if you're not following the rules properly, the patient often comes to you for the first time, you look at the patient, the A1C targets are high, you start the therapy. The patient comes back to you after three months, there's a marginal improvement, the patient's not at goal. You said just continue the same treatment plan. The patient doesn't turn up to you for six months. And then you say he comes back to you, you say, okay, you're fairly okay, make some changes. But at no point of time do you see the patients getting to the goal or the aggression being on part of the doctor or on part of the patient. So obviously we have to gear up. The patient-related inertia comes from education and counseling. But whereas the doctor-related inertia is something that we all are aware of the benefits of diabetes control. And unless we gear up to say that we need to pull up our socks and say that, no, you have to do this, we need to have teams which will do the task of following up the patient. Unfortunately, in our country, the doctors rolled up as a medical professional, educator, nutritionist, and everything. And they're wearing multiple hats for, for the patient. And that doesn't work. We need to build teams, and we need to build teams so that patients can be you know, properly followed up in different areas. Because we know the impact of nutrition, activity, weight change, all this that has an impact on the glucose. It's not just about drugs that we're really talking about. And that's what is going to translate into better controls. So the inertia, a large part of it comes from our own lack of resources, or lack of knowledge, or just the fact that we are not motivated enough to see that, you know, are we doing for the right. The inertia at times comes from the fact that we are not ready to escalate the patient from oral therapies to insulin therapy. And that's very sad because we know the need that is required that if the patient is getting three or more oral drugs, this patient is not going to be at goal. It's time that you start the patient on insulin therapy, and yet we don't want to lose the patient, and we keep the patient suboptimally controlled. So, as I said, that 50% of our healthcare prof you know, reasons, professionals tend to be inertia. Approximately 30% are due to patient-related inertia factors, and probably 20% are process or system-related inertias that we really talk about. So, the connected blood glucose systems now are probably a way that we may have a solution. May not be the best solution, but probably a more practical solution. And when you look back, as I said, on the charts, the challenges were the time and the difficulty in consuming the, and analyzing the data because they were never properly entered in. The loss of logbook is very important. Patient just said, I lost the chart. Now you're blank. You don't know what to do. Or very often, the, the charts are filled up in the most illegible manner. Or, as I said, that patients do tend to have gaps in the testing and that really doesn't have any kind of a meaning to you. Or it's just a literacy problem that the patient may have and may not be able to really chart it properly and may be able to you know, manage the diabetes. So the benefit is digitalization. Today, everything is healthcare is having you know, digitalization. And today, in the digital world, there are definite benefits that we're really looking at. So we have to accept digitalization because it is probably structuring the healthcare in a more meaningful manner. Uh, it's probably complementing our own way of working with digitalization and improving the efficiency of the system. So when you digitalize the SMBGs, the, you get a dashboard of complete summary of the day. You can do pattern detections on the you know, connected meters. You can understand the graphics that are there, when is it the highs and lows for the patient. You can often you know, interpret that and make the changes in the treatment and see the fallout of that. So if you look at, you know, I'm just taking to the CGM, and very often when you've got the AGPs that are there and you put the AGP for the patient, look at the patterns for the first three days, make the changes in the insulin, and then you relook it after three days or four days, and you see the changes in the highs and lows, you know that you have done a better job in terms of detection of, you know, what or changes in the treatment that you want to make in terms of your dosing or the type of insulin that you're doing. So it does have an impact in better control. 
And probably after all this, you may be able to track a better estimated A1C values from the connected glucose meters. And if you're looking at multiple A1C, uh, multiple SMBG points of the patient. So we now come to more of integrated personalized diabetes management. It's an interventional approach which consists of, you know, different digital tools which are collecting together to see how best you can make treatments more meaningful. It brings together physicians and patients in a collaborative and therapeutic decision making. Remember, it can never be a one-way uh, sort of conversation between the patient and the doctor. You need to have a bi-directional relationship and you need to understand the patient and yet give the advice in the best possible manner which is suitable for the patient and this helps you to do that. And it sort of incorporates six defined steps which sort of throughout, which is re required for diabetic care processes and it is ideally adapted to the patient's unique circumstances. And what are the six areas? We talk about structured assessment and training. We talk about structured and therapy adapted SMBGs. So you sort of predefine the SMBG schemes according to current A1C values and insulin therapy scheme and do a structured collection of the SMBG data. Then you do a proper structured documentation. So you download and process the SMBG data and generate a structured SMBG reports by connecting the dots of differently, different can, uh, you know, tested blood glucoses and you can then put a pattern analysis to it. And then, of course, based on the pattern analysis, you can do personalized treatment, and then you assess the treatment effectiveness and assessment of the patient. Okay. Uh, this now with the current ways that we've got digitalization, we've got through Bluetooth connectivity between the testing uh, meters and your iPhones or Android phones. And then, of course, you can sort of real-time transfer the data from the uh, from the uh, meters into the phone and that can be stored and then the patient can come back to you with all the data and you can make some interpretation out of it. So the connected glucose meters, they provide a friendly visualization of blood glucose strengths, the time spent in range, the time spent in hypoglycemia, the cloud storage of all this data so you can retrieve it at any point of time and ability to email the digital blood glucose diary to the patient's to the physician's office along with the entire storing of the information so it has a reproducibility and you can store it and often use it for comparative purposes or transfer it to the doctor even if you're in a distant location so that the doctor can make the best decision for you uh, the ipdm gives you the benefit of improvement in time and range, and now we not only talk about SMBG and uh, continuous glucose monitoring as matrices, so we also talk about A1C, SMBG, and time and range. So all these three now complement each other because we know that you need to have more than 70% of the time in a day when somebody should be in time and range to have a better effective control. And this helps us to collect, integrate, and analyze disease-relevant data points to support the decision for the doctor and delay disease progressions. This is a very good paper that came out on IPDM and the results of the uh, PDM Pro Value Study Program. And what did they look at is 907 patients, 51 practices in 12 months. And they looked at the six points of structured and therapy adaptive glucose monitoring, documentation, collaborative review, personalized treatment, assess effectiveness and needs. And the net result of all this was there was a reduction in A1C by 0.5%. Reduction in hypoglycemia events by 8%. The patient satisfaction was 12.2 on the DTSQ rate. The adherence went up by about 20%. And the satisfaction quotient with IPDM guided therapy was improved. And it gained 0.52 life years and 0.287 uh, quality of associated life years per patient. So the net value of integrated personal diabetes management for the healthcare professional was it overcomes errors in therapeutic objectives. It initiates adequate treatment in a, in a timely manner. It manages to intensify treatment until the therapeutic goal is achieved. From the patient's point of view, it increases the health literacy by better patient involvement. It improves doctor-patient communication and it gives more confidence in the doctor. And from the healthcare system point of view, the better routines for monitoring treatment outcomes, better decision support, and support with administration or databases of the patient data. So I'll end up my talk with the 
take home message that patients with diabetes are heterogeneous in their clinical features and there is a clinical need for personalized diabetes management that covers several issues. Implementation of IPDM, which brings together physicians and the patients with type 2 diabetes in joint decision making, results in significant improvements in glycemic control. By providing a more systematic overview regarding diabetes data for physicians and patients, the IPDM triggers timely therapeutic actions. And the combination of an easy to implement approach with connected meters, structured SMBG, and integration of a software solution shows the potential of IPDM to improve clinical outcomes for a large and growing group of patients with type 2 diabetes treated with insulin and may help to overcome clinical inertia. Doing now what the patients need next is what is very important. Thank you very much.